What we need is not more medication, but more education, because the best prescription is knowledge. This is Exposé, coming to you live from Lagos, Nigeria, every Monday on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook simultaneously. I'm your regular host, Tony Akiyam. Don't, don't forget, what we need what is we not need more medication, more medication but, more but more education, because the best prescription is knowledge. Hello and welcome to Expose with Tony Akinyemi. I'm your regular host. What we need is not more medication, but more education for the best prescription is knowledge. This beautiful Monday evening, I welcome you to the second part in our series on allergies. We concluded last week looking at what are allergies, we started with the immune system, understanding the function of the immune system, and then what causes an allergic reaction. And then we defined some terms. I hope you still remember those terms and what they mean. Allergen, we looked at allergic response. We looked at antigen, we defined antibody, prophylaxis, anaphylaxis, hyperallergenic, hypoallergenic, I'll be using those terms, you know, in this series a lot. That's why I took time last week to define them. In case you didn't see the first part of this, you may want to go back and take a look at the video. It's right there on Facebook and on YouTube. And then we also looked at antibodies in greater details. We looked at five different types of antibodies that our bodies can produce. IgG, IgA, IgM, IgE and IgD. And we said that the Ig there stands for immunoglobulins, all right? So today we want to continue this conversation on allergies and we want to look at what happens in an allergic reaction. When someone is having an allergic reaction to something, and again, I mentioned last week that that something could be either food or substances in the environment. If it is coming from food, then it, they are called food allergens. If it is chemicals and substances in the environment, smoke, dust, animal dander, flower pulling, anything in the environment, we call those ones environmental allergens. Now, so when somebody gets exposed to an allergen and the person is having an allergic response or an allergic reaction, what exactly happens in an allergic reaction. I hope they can show you the photo of a young boy who is having an allergic reaction that is manifesting as angioedema, uh, angioedema of the face, uh, such that the boy cannot even open his eyes. And incidentally, that happened to me when I was young. I still remember. I mean, incidentally, things that happened in my life, in my family, when I was four, five, six, seven, eight, I still remember them vividly as if they happened yesterday. I don't know how that is. I don't know if that is how everybody recalls, but I can still remember what happened when I was four, when I was five, when I was six. The day they were taking me to primary school, I still remember when they were asking me to put my hand over my head, whether my hand can touch the ear on the other side. I still remember. <laughs> I remember my primary one, my primary two, you know, very vividly. So I remember when I was in primary one, primary two, I used to have this serious allergic reaction. Probably that would be around the age of six and seven, okay? When I would wake up in the morning and there would be, my eyes would be swollen and mucus, and it's like the mucus would just seal off the eye that I want to open the eyes and the eyes will not open. You know, sometimes they will have to soak a face towel in warm water and my mother would be using it to, you know, wipe off all the mucus that have sealed off the eyes and wipe them off and kind of massage gently the eyes before I would be able to do a little opening. I still remember all of those episodes. That is an example of how a person, you know, manifests or expresses 
when having an allergic reaction. I particularly had a lot of angioedema of the face that I couldn't open my eyes, okay? Now, allergy, like I said, is essentially immunity gone wrong, where a normally harmless substance is perceived by the person's immune system as a threat. The immune system perceives it as an allergen and then attacked by the body's immunological defenses. Okay, now when that happens, the body produces antibodies and we have looked at five of them. An antibody is a protein that specifically binds to another protein called an antigen. In this case, the antigen is the allergen, that substance that is causing an allergic reaction. And the reason the body produces those antibodies to bind to the allergen is so that it can deactivate it and remove it from the body. The allergen is perceived as an intruder and the immune system wants to arrest it and take it out of the body, okay? Now, the class of antibodies that are known as immunoglobulin E, IgE, that particular class reacts with the allergen and this in turn triggers a reaction with the mast cells, which are tissue cells uh, and basophils, a type of uh, white blood cells. And mast cells are found below the surface of the skin and in the membrane lining of the nose, in the respiratory tract, in the eyes, in the intestines, everywhere. And once there is a trigger, the mast cells begin to pump out histamine. Now, this substance called histamine, as well as about 28 other such chemicals or other substances such as leukotrienes and prostaglandins are released from mast cells and they cause allergic responses. I'm told that there are about eight different types of prostaglandins. Now, conventional doctors therefore usually prescribe antihistamines for those suffering from allergies to address the symptoms and uh, not necessarily the root cause because all that antihistamines will do is uh, either to mop up existing histamine in the bloodstream or to stop the mast cells from churning out more histamine, okay? That does not address the reason the body is having that allergic reaction. Now, the adverse reactions in an allergic reaction are immediate and sometimes usually localized. Sometimes there could be one, two, three, four days delay before that reaction takes place. And so you may not even be able to link what triggered it to the outcome that you're experiencing, the symptoms that you're feeling. Now, some allergic reactions can take several hours, several days uh, after that individual is exposed to that foreign protein, the allergen. Now, these are often called delayed hypersensitivity reactions, delayed hypersensitivity reaction. Now, let's look a little bit into history. Has the human race always experienced allergic reactions right from the time of Adam and Eve? Well, we don't know because there's no documentation to that effect. We can only speculate, you know, when we go far, that far backwards. <laughs> All right, but historically, from documented evidence, it actually indicates that it was not originally like this. Allergies were never part of human experience ab initio. Because the first case of uh, milk allergy, somebody having an allergic reaction to cow's milk, the first case of such milk allergy was published only in 1901. That's a little over 100 years ago. That's 122 years ago, 1901. Now, uh, that publication uh, actually won um, uh, a Nobel Prize in 1913, you know, by these guys, uh, Richard and Portia, uh, the Prince of Monaco, okay? Then the, the first case of nut allergy, you know, some people react to ground nuts or some other kinds of nuts. The first case of nut allergy was documented only in 1920, just about 102 years ago, or 103 years ago, I should say. And then, specifically, sesame seed allergy was first documented only in 1950. 1950 is just 73 years ago. And the first case of Brazil nut anaphylaxis that was recorded and documented in the UK occurred only 
1983. Just 1983. That's just about 50 years ago. You know? So, uh, sorry, did I say 50 years ago? That should be 40 years ago, 1983 to 2023. Yeah? That's just 40 years ago that that happened. The first case of Brazil not anaphylaxis in the UK. Now, the, the kind of um, things that can trigger other things apart from milk, apart from nuts, that can also trigger an allergic reaction, like I said, uh, you know, other foods that are hyperallergenic, and then environmental pollutants, uh, chemical exposures, uh, even dust, smoke, um, animal dander, if you keep pets, um, pollen in the flower, from the flower in the environment, all of these. Now, generally, allergens find their way into the human body through any of several channels, okay? It can come through the nose when we breathe, when we breathe in air. You know, certain things can float in the air and we can inhale them. So it can come in through breathing. It can come in through the mouth as we eat and drink and even take medications or whatever it is that comes through our mouth into the body. That's another route. As they say in North America, in the UK we say another route, R-O-U-T-E. In Nigeria, we say another root. Of course, these days, Nigerians are beginning to switch from root to route. All right. <laughs> another, another access to the body that allergens find, you know, channels by which they enter into the body is through the skin. The skin happens to be the largest organ in the human body. It wraps us up <laughs> and covers everything up. That's the largest organ of the body. And things can penetrate through the skin into the body. Many people don't realize that. Tattoos, broken skin, and even sometimes, you know, just plain skin like this. Anything you put on your skin can go into your body, get into your bloodstream, go into your liver, go into your kidneys, go into your brain, anywhere. That's why anything that you cannot eat, don't apply it on your body. <laughs> That's a tall order, isn't it? All right, so it can come through the nose, it can come through the mouth, it can come through the skin, and then it can come through injections. And when I say injections, you might be thinking of a nurse, you know, holding a syringe in her hand or in his hand to punch you and puncture you and then pour, press something into your body. Well, that's one form of it, injections. It can come through vaccinations. It can come even through insect bites. Do you know that when an insect bites you, it has this long proboscis, you know, it uses it to puncture the skin and then it begins to suck. Sometimes it will inject a venom or saliva or something. When the mosquito bites you, it punctures and perforates, and then it spits its saliva inside some enzymes, and then it begins to suck the blood. Somebody joked the other day, he said, he doesn't understand some nurses. They will be looking for veins and veins, and they will be looking for veins. They will say they can't find a person's vein. He said, just bring a mosquito. At once, the mosquito will locate the veins. <laughs> So mosquitoes are better nurses, maybe. <laughs> That's just, you know, on the lighter mood. Right, so allergens can enter the body through the nose, through the mouth, through the skin, through injections. Now, allergens are categorized based on how they enter the body, how they find their way into the body. That's how scientists have categorized them. So if an allergen enters the body, you know, normally, through the nostrils, through breathing, when you inhale them, such allergens are referred to as inhalants. Okay, allergens that are inhaled, usually through the nose, like pollen, like smoke, like, you know, generator or automobile exhaust, the fumes that come from a car or a truck or a generator, the smell of paint, you know, mold pores, floating in the air. I spoke about mold some time ago in one of my episodes, okay? Then even scents from detergent, that, that smell, beautiful smell that we feel from soap and from, you know, uh, body sprays and, uh, 
you know, air fresheners and perfumes and what have you, and even dust, okay? All of these typically enter the body through the nostrils, and once they get into the, nose, into the body, they provoke an allergic reaction. The body begins to react to it, an allergic response. So any allergen that you inhale through your nostrils, they are called inhalants. Allergens that are swallowed through the mouth, either from food or from drinks or from medications, those ones are called ingestants because you ingest them. Allergens that make contacts with the skin, okay, like latex, gloves, you know, latex gloves that, you know, doctors, nurses, medical professionals usually wear, okay, before they start attending to patients. They are made of rubber that contains latex, latex gloves, okay? Or cosmetics, also through the, the, the skin. Heavy metals in jewelry, such as nickel, okay? Certain plants, uh, such as poison ivy and what have you, when they touch the skin, the allergen in them enters into the body through the skin. Those ones are called such allergens that enter the body through the skin. They are called contactants, contactants. Isn't it wonderful? Now, those allergens that are injected into the muscle or blood vessels, such as vaccinations, some injections given in hospitals, or insect bites, those ones are called injectants. So, four categories of allergens categorized based on the route or the route or the channel <laughs> through which they find their way into the body. They are either inhalants, inhaled through the nose, or ingestants, swallowed through the mouth, or contactants, they just touch our skin, or injectants that are injected into the body. All right, so let's now go on and look at allergy symptoms. When a person is having an allergic reaction, what are the normal symptoms that we see? Now, symptoms that may indicate that a person is having an allergic reaction may include, but are not limited to the following. Number one, when there's a breakout of acne, that could be a sign of an allergic reaction. Sometimes ADD or ADHD, that's attention deficit disorder or attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. That can also be a sign that a child is having an allergic reaction. Anaphylactic shock, I've, I've explained that before, when somebody eats something like granite or something like uh, shrimp, when they're allergic to those hyperallergenic substances, they can go into anaphylactic shock where they can go into a kind of coma, they can even die from there if care is not taken. Everywhere swells up, including the lungs. Bell chain can be an, uh, an allergy symptom. Okay, bloating, breathing congestion. Some people have such breathing congestion that sometimes doctors mistake them uh, for asthma. So they misdiagnose those people having breathing congestion as a symptom of allergy. They diagnose them as being asthmatic. Sometimes constriction of the bronchial tubes, making it difficult to breathe. And that produces the same asthma-like symptoms. Sometimes it could be constipation. Okay, sometimes headaches or migraines could be signs of an allergic reaction. Itchy eyes, well, that's very, very obvious. <laughs> when somebody has itchy, watery eyes, you know, inflamed, sometimes bloodshot and teary eyes, you know, that is glaringly a sign of an allergic reaction. Of course, other things can provoke it, but primarily that's the first thing to sus suspect. Sometimes insomnia, sometimes lack of mental clarity, lethargy, mood swing, puffy face, skin rashes, especially around the neck, you know, and everywhere that folds, you know, right here, right here on the elbow, and then right here at the back of the leg and the groins, you know, anywhere that folds, you know, like that in the body, you see rashes where the skin looks like that of a toad or a frog. Okay, that, those are symptoms of uh, an allergic reaction. We, we go on a short break and when we come back, we'll be looking at other signs and the categories, you know, various categorizations of these uh, symptoms or signs of an allergic reaction. Don't go away. We'll be back very shortly. Meet Emily. 
She is passionate about living a healthy life, but finds it difficult to assess information on health and wellness. Cancer is so that is until she discovered the online healthy living training offered by Reverend Tony Akiemi on lms.rafainstitute.org. The online healthy living training program is a comprehensive interactive course that covers topics such as nutrition, fitness, stress management, and mental health. The course is designed to provide participants with practical tips and strategies to improve their health and well-being. Emily is now equipped with the knowledge and skills she needs to live a healthy life. Join Emily and countless others in living a healthy life by signing up for the online healthy living training program today. Welcome back. This is still Expose with Tony Akinyemi. What we need is not more medication, but more education for the best prescription is knowledge. In this series, we're dealing with allergies. Uh, that is because it is becoming a global challenge, a global nuisance, so to speak. So next, in this second part, we'll be looking at signs and types of allergy. Signs of allergy, different types of allergy. Now, there are certain symptoms, a cluster of symptoms, that when you see them in a person, they indicate the type of allergy that the person is having. A certain cluster of symptoms, for example, will make me suspect that this person is having uh, environmental or seasonal allergy. In other words, what is provoking that person's allergic reaction are environmental allergens or seasonal allergens. Okay? Then there's another cluster of symptoms that I will see that will make me know that this person is having this allergic reaction because of uh, sensitivity or intolerance to certain foods, food allergy. There are certain symptoms that will indicate that this must be food allergy, not environmental allergy. Okay, there are another cluster of symptoms that I will see in the person and I will say, well, this, this looks like chemical reactions or a reaction to chemicals or contaminants. Allergies due to a reaction to chemicals and contaminants in the environment. Now, let, let's look at the clusters of symptoms. Now, if a person presents with chronic, long, bronchial, and sinus infections that is itchy uh, and then has watery nose and watery eyes, he has frontal headaches with sneezing and sneezing, coughing attacks and sore, uh, sore throat or scratchy, itchy throat, swollen face with itchy or rashy skin, skin rash on arms and torso, all these clusters of symptoms, for me, would indicate that this person is having an environmental allergy or seasonal allergy. Another cluster of symptoms that will make me uh, imagine that a person is having food allergy is when I see symptoms like somebody being unable to eat normal amounts of food, you know, somebody is nauseated after eating, or has cyclical headaches, you know, or with blurred vision or mental fuzziness after eating, runny nose, itchy, watery eyes, sweating, heart palpitations or hives after eating, all of that will clearly indicate to me that this person is having food allergy. Then the next cluster of symptoms will make me imagine that the person is having allergies to contaminants or chemicals. If the person has inexplicable migraine headaches, usually with nausea or diarrhea. Now, frequent skin rashes, burning or stinging eyes. Somebody always feeling under the weather, you know, no matter how much rest, how much sleep he or she gets, and the, and the ears ringing, especially at night. Uh, that's tinnitus or, tinnitus or tinnitus, depending on which part of the world you are pronouncing it from. Okay, frequent colds and flu or chronic respiratory inflammations, low immune response to them, dizziness, vertigo, you know, shortness of breath, now, and, and, and so on and so forth, or inexplicable weight gain or weight loss, and all of that will make me imagine that this person is 
an allergic reaction to contaminants, chemicals, and what have you in the environment. Chem chemical uh, sensitivity. All right. So those are different signs to indicate what type of allergy or what type of an allergic reaction this person is having. All right. Now, there are also different types of allergies, like we said. You know, I just mentioned food allergies, environmental allergies, uh, chemical sensitivities, but there are others. Sinus allergies also there, and what have you, sick building syndrome, and all of that. Now, so what's, what is food allergy? Food allergy is when an individual develops an allergic reaction to food that other people have impunity and nothing happens. And I have identified some hyperallergenic foods, foods that are, you know, that usually they have a high propensity for provoking an allergic reaction in many people in the population. Those are food allergies. Then environmental allergies are when an environmental substance other than food is responsible for an allergic reaction in, uh, in a person or in people generally. The most common environmental substances that can trigger uh, an allergic reaction will include things like, you know, pets, and you have cats, dogs, and what have you at home, dust, you know, polluted indoor air, kitchen smoke from frying with oil, tobacco smoke, mold, the pores of mold in the air, uh, flower pulling, those are all things that can provoke environmental allergies. Then we have sinus allergies centered around the sinuses above and below the eyes, okay? Generally mild to moderate pain can occur there. Pressure, you know, often makes sometimes the teeth to ache, you know. It may include feeling of pressure behind the eyes, often relieved by, you know, a class of remedies that they refer to as decongestants or sometimes antihistamines and other, you know, allergy medications. Okay, and, and sinus allergy is often seasonal during a particular season of the year when things that irritate the sinuses actually become, you know, become more abundant in the environment. Chemical sensitivities are uh, allergic reactions to chemicals in the environment such as perfumes, scent detergents, insecticide sprays, uh, various cosmetics, uh, uh, pesticides that are used in agriculture that find their way into our food, heavy metals, you know, dental materials, building materials, for example. Now, newly finished buildings, brand new buildings, just painted or renovated buildings, just painted and fitted with carpets, you know, rugs, furniture and so on, usually emit a lot of chemicals and odors. And these chemicals and smell and scents and odors, you know, are capable of evoking allergic reactions in some people. Now, this emission of gaseous chemicals, you know, is usually referred to as gassing. Now, when you buy a brand new car, for example, tear up, call it in Nigeria, there's a way the inside of the car smells. Those, those chemicals that you're perceiving in the car, they're not healthy. That is outgassing the leather, the fabric, the materials that are used in the interior of the brand new vehicle, they outgas. Chemicals are oozing out of them. And so when you enter that car and you inhale those, some people can have an allergic reaction to that smell. Even if you don't have an allergic reaction to the smell, that smell, that chemical odor is not healthy for us. So if you have a brand new car in particular, when you want to enter, it's a good idea to first of all open the doors, you know, or wind down and let it ventilate properly before you wind up again and put on your air conditioners if you want to use your air conditioners. If you don't need air conditioners, better still, as you're driving, you know, the wind will be blowing through the car and blowing away all the chemical outgassing so that you don't inhale them, all right? So very, very important, all right, if you have a brand new car. I, 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 want, I, I want brand new cars. I don't want uh, need to come for anymore. I want brand new, and I, I believe you want brand new too. And if you want brand new, then you need to understand that when you have these brand new cars, this is how to use them so that you don't injure yourself with a brand new thing that God just blessed you with. Outgassing. Now, buildings that are filled with offensive and toxic chemicals and other environmental substances can actually make people that live inside that building sick with symptoms, you know, that are referred to as the sick building syndrome, SBS, sick 
building syndrome. Now, buildings should be designed, you know, to allow proper ventilation. Very, very important. All right. Now, we are going to be looking at common allergenic substances again so that, you know, we can, we can acquaint ourselves with them and be sure that, yes, we are able to identify them and we are able to, you know, protect ourselves against them. And if um, we have any allergic reaction, we'll be able to pinpoint and say, well, maybe this or that is what is causing it so that we can take the necessary steps, you know, to mitigate it. So let's look at common allergic substances. Number one, all processed and heavily cooked foods, they contain an abundance of denatured enzymes, food enzymes that have been denatured. And denatured food enzymes are highly allergenic in the body. I will call them hyperallergenic. All processed and heavily cooked foods with, you know, an abundance of denatured enzymes. So if you see your child, maybe under 10, maybe even a teenager, or even in their 20s, sometimes even adults, you know, in their 40s and 50s, can exhibit symptoms of allergic reactions. Now, when you see any sign, even though in my own experience, I see more allergic reactions among children than adults, okay? It can happen to anybody, even those in their 90s, but I see it more in children. Now, when you see any allergic reaction in your child, even without knowing precisely what could be responsible, what allergen could be responsible for that allergic reaction, my suggestion is that you take note of all of these common allergenic substances that we are mentioning and simply take your child off them. That could jolly well more than 50% solve the problem. And within days, you see your child normalizing, breathing, normalizing, rashes, disappearing, itchiness of the eyes and watery eyes and sore throat and itchy throat and all of those things begin to dissipate and disappear. So take away all processed foods, anything in tin and carton from the supermarket, from your child's diet. Serve that child only food that comes from the garden, from the farm, and enters into the kitchen, maybe only passing through the marketplace, the market where you went to buy it, or, or the supermarket, or the grocery store, or the farmer's shop, wherever you bought it from. You left the farm, he went to the market, and then you bought it in the market, you brought it to the kitchen, where you prepare it and make it ready as a meal, and it goes to the dining table. Maximum of those four locations. If you have your own garden, then it comes from the garden straight to the kitchen, from the kitchen to the dining table, three bus stops. The dining table being the final one before it enters your body. Maximum of four. Farm, market, kitchen, dining table. If it branches elsewhere, then don't give it to your child. If your child is having allergies. What are the other locations it can branch into? <laughs> well, it can branch from the farm into the factory before getting to the market. Once it goes to the factory, the manufacturing plant, it is going to undergo some kind of processing, and you never can tell what will be done to that thing that came from the garden and got to the factory before it came to the market, before you bought it and brought it to your own kitchen and then to the dining hall. Once it goes to the factory, it can be denatured, it can be heated and damaged, preservatives can be added to it, Food uh, enhancers, like flavor enhancers, artificial flavors, artificial colors, emulsifiers. I mean, you name it. All kinds of different chemicals can be added to them. Monosodium glutamate, salt, sugar, high fructose corn syrup, all kinds of things can be added before it finally gets to the market. So when you now buy it in the market and bring it home and serve it to your child, it has a high propensity to create an allergic reaction in that child. So 
Again, I will say it this way. Eat only food from God's plant. Don't eat food from a manufacturing plant. <laughs> Both are plants. The one is God's plant in the garden. The other one is the manufacturing plant where food is processed. Now, am I saying I don't believe in food processing? Of course I do. I do, yeah. There is this value chain, value addition to farm produce before it gets to the market. But the kind of processes we subject food to before they arrive in the supermarket, in our kitchen and on our dining table, those processes will determine whether those food items, so-called, will be beneficial to the body or actually cause more harm to the body. Such foods that have been damaged because of all the things done to them before they reach us, I call them foodless foods. Foodless foods. Okay. So common allergenic substances, that's where we started from, all processed and heavily you know, cooked foods. I would suggest that if your child is having allergies, anything in a carton, anything in a tin, don't give that child. Anything from the farm, yam, potatoes, sweet potatoes, um, some kind, some, some form of whole grains, uh, even though grains also have a high propensity for causing allergic reactions. Right, so this number two is copper cookware. Copper cookware is the choice of many you know, because it conducts heat so well. Copper cookware releases copper into the food to be eaten and usually also has, you know, nickel in the coating of the, of the cookware, which is another toxic heavy metal that can be very, very uh, metals in food can cause allergic reactions. Now, besides the added cancer risk, Scientists are concerned that an increasing number of people are becoming allergic to the contents of hair dyes, the dyes that people use to dye their hair, sometimes even developing fatal reactions. So dyes can be another source. So if you have an allergic reaction, I would suggest you don't use any type of hair dye. Okay? Now, according to a PhD holder, Nancy Appleton, she claims that sugar also causes food allergies. Sugar. So if your child is allergic to substances you're not even sure of, these are the things to take away, sugar inclusive. Then there are certain preservatives that are used in, you know, in preserving foods. I, I, I used to love this powdered yam powder, not, not a luboy as we call it in Nigeria, but the one that you actually turn and it becomes like pounded yam, okay? yam dehydrated white yam you know you pour it into hot water and turn it and it forms into this mold which we call pounded yam you know jokingly my wife and i we call that type of pounded yam we call it tonded yam yam that is toned tonded yam <laughs> now those yam flowers that we used to make those toned or tonded pounded yam <laughs> they they i i, I examined the instruction at the back of one of them, the packaging, and I saw that they used certain preservatives to preserve the yam. That was when I stopped eating that type of pounded yam. I stopped eating tonded yam. I saw that they used BHA and BHT to preserve them, and they use it in many, many other kinds of food. So when you buy anything, if you must eat anything that is packaged, if you buy them, look at the ingredients. Anytime you see preservatives like BHA, BHT, please don't eat it. That's my advice. Apart from causing uh, capability of causing allergic reactions, I also read some reports that actually suggested that it could also cause cancer, BHA and BHD, even though those preservatives are generally endorsed as safe in the food industry. They come into what they call the grass category. Grass, G-R-O-A-S. Generally regarded as safe. Grass. So they give them the grass classification. Generally regarded as safe. But then, you know, these two preservatives, BHA and BHT. BHA is a butylated hydroxyanisole. Butylated hydroxyanisole, BHA. And then BHT is butylated hydroxytoluene. 
Now, they are commonly used preservatives that can be found in breakfast cereals, apart from those uh, dehydrated yam, you know, powders that I mentioned. You can find them in nut mixes, in chewing gum, in butter spread, in beer, like a beer, yeah? In processed meat, you know, corned beef, bacon, sausage, hot dog, ham, what have you, processed meat. In dehydrated potatoes, they use this, you know, BHA, BHT as preservative. Now, BHA is known to cause cancer in rats, in animal studies. And it may be a cancer-causing agent in humans as well. We don't know. But at least it has been confirmed that it causes cancer in rats. In fact, according to the United States uh, Department of Health and Human Services, uh, their National Toxicology Program's 2011 report on carcinogens, BHA was quoted, and I quote, as reasonably anticipated to be a human carcinogen, unquote, by the Department of Health and Human Services National Toxicology Program's 2011 uh, report on carcinogens. They say BHA is reasonably anticipated to be a human carcinogen. A carcinogen is a cancer-causing agent. Now, BHA may also trigger allergic reactions and hyperactivity, whereas BHT can cause organ system toxicity. Now, according to Dr. John Barron, in, uh, in one of his newsletters, John Barron, by the way, is of the Baseline uh, of Health Foundation, the Baseline of Health Foundation. He wrote an article titled, uh, Vaccines Good or Bad? And it was published in his Natural Health Newsletter of February 7, 2015. And he said, and I quote, that eggs are one of the most allergenic foods around, unquote, by Dr. John Barron. Eggs are one of the most allergenic foods around. So as you can see, common allergenic substances, things you need to take away from your children or maybe even adults when they're experiencing allergic reactions, remove all processed foods. Don't use uh, aluminum cookware or copper cookware. Uh, avoid hair dyes. Avoid um, sugar, refined sugar. Avoid most nuts, particularly peanuts. Avoid cow's milk. Avoid eggs. Avoid uh, soy milk. Avoid genetically modified organisms, GMO foods. You know, uh, avoid fresh corn, whether it is boiled or roasted. Those are hyperallergenic substances. I've been told that my time is up, so I have to wrap it up here. Thank you for spending your Monday evening with me. And those of you who will be watching later, whatever time you watch it, thank you for finding time to hope you have been blessed by the nuggets, the pieces of information that we have shared. This is Expose with Tony Akinyemi. What we need is not more medication, but more education for the best prescription is knowledge. To be informed is to be transformed. To be uninformed is to be deformed. The Bible says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And again, it says you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. In another place it says, for by knowledge shall the just or the righteous be delivered. May the information you have lead to your liberation and emancipation from all the afflictions that you may have faced due to ignorance or due to indulgences. And may God give you the grace, the wisdom, and the discipline to be able to do the needful Play your role, play your part. Don't abdicate your responsibility. And don't begin to play the blame game by blaming others for your woes and not taking responsibility so that you can make adjustments and correct corrections where necessary. Okay, have a beautiful week ahead of you. And if you are yet to subscribe to our YouTube channel, please go ahead and just click on the subscribe button right now. If you have not yet liked us on Facebook, please go ahead and like us. I tell people, even if, even if you don't like my face, at least like me on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, you'll be blessed for it because goodies will come your way by way of rich information, relevant information, information that can lead to your health, positive transformation. All right, and if you, uh, if you have friends, if you have family, if you have relatives, if you have colleagues, if you have classmates, you know, old boys association, old girls association, alumni, you know, associations, just forward this to them on your platform. They will thank you 
for sharing this beautiful information with them. God bless you. See you same time on same platform, typically 8 p.m. every Monday, Nigerian time, West African time. God bless. Bye. Love you. Meet Emily. She is passionate about living a healthy life, but finds it difficult to assess information on health and wellness. Cancer is so that is until she discovered the online healthy living training offered by Reverend Tony Akiyemi on lms.rafainstitute.org. The online healthy living training program is a comprehensive interactive course that covers topics such as nutrition, fitness, stress management, and mental health. The course is designed to provide participants with practical tips and strategies to improve their health and well-being. Emily is now equipped with the knowledge and skills she needs to live a healthy life. Join Emily and countless others in living a healthy life by signing up for the online healthy living training program today.